Hello and welcome to uh, the Hearts Table Talk podcast. We are excited on, is this Table Talk 11? Or am I not mistaken? Uh, I don't I don't remember what number it is, but uh, it is many, many moons into the Table Talk project and we are here on the verge of an election. And so, of course, in the spirit of Table Talks, trying to find uh, the spaces of of division, trying to find find spaces of of contention, and attempting to speak uh, and shed more light than heat onto those issues. We are gathered here uh, with some friends. I'll introduce in a moment uh, uh, to talk about our dual citizenship. Okay, um, now there's a wordplay here. Uh, since I'm on audio form, you can't hear the letters I'm saying, but is it dual citizenship as in D-U-A-L or is it dual citizenship as in D-U-E-L as in dueling citizenships? So um, let me introduce my friends here. She didn't bring her banjo today, but this would be a great time to have the intro to dueling banjos. Uh, I'm joined uh, by uh, our, one of our teaching team, Amanda Opel. So let's say hello, Amanda, if you want to introduce yourself and then we'll introduce Sue Alice. Go for it. Um, I am Amanda Opelt. Uh, banjos uh, don't always duel. Sometimes they play in harmony. Ah. Um, but yeah, I'm Amanda Opelt. I'm happy to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting me into the conversation. And also joining us is Sue Alice Sadoff um, of the Sadoff fam. Uh, Sue Alice, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, glad to be here as well. Um, I'm Sue Alice. This is a topic I'm really excited about us diving into and just lowering the temperature that I feel like the world is trying to push upon us. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. indeed. I was hoping that you would also procure a banjo and we would just, um, yeah, duel. But anyway. I've never played um, a banjo, but yeah, maybe now's yeah. the time. You've been in the mountains long enough, Sue Alice. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah. it's contagious banjo playing. Anyway, um, I actually don't play banjo for the record. I, I want to, but okay, let's let me focus. Um, so one of the one of the things that we wanted to do for this table talk is to to sit in this tension, uh, obviously connoted by the wordplay of our title, dual citizenship or dueling citizenship. What we're referring to there is that we are both citizens of the kingdom of heaven and citizens of our earthly kingdom. So for our audience, we're here in America. So uh Amanda in you know framing up this particular conversation we uh you know what what questions came to mind and and the big one is our is our opener uh why is this so complicated to figure out the relationship between these two citizenships how do they correlate what, what yeah so could you could you explore some of the complexities uh speak to those yeah. well I, I think the question for me it's like why why is the temperature so hot on mm -hmm. this why why is it that christians have such um vehement and vitriolic sometimes feelings towards one another when we disagree on this topic um wh why is it so why does it keep me up at night that that's what i want to know because there's there's a lot of theological issues there's there's a lot of social things like that that i'm like i i wrestle with it but i sleep at night but this one this one this one kind of keeps me up at night um sometimes that's because debates go late into the night that's fair <laughs> such as last night we're recording this um the morning after the presidential debate but um i, I think it's i think it's just important to realize that um you know, a lot of people say like, well, let's not make everything political. Let's not make everything political. But politics in some ways is simply how we organize our communal life together mm. uh, without going to war. <laughs> and the existence of politics to me um, kind of names a communal reality, right? Like it, um, it, it names the fact that we cannot live alone. We cannot exist alone. We must figure out ways to live together in a community in ways that promote flourishing, uh, in ways that promote harmony. And all of our debates emerge from disagreements on how best um, to, to do that. And But I think that's why politics actually feels so sacred. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it doesn't feel secular because it asks questions of the, like, you know, well, is it okay to murder someone? Mm -hmm. Is it okay to um, to steal something? Is it okay to use a drug that's harmful but may not impact someone else? Can you drive without a seatbelt? You know what I mean? You know, what What about questions around um, children who are in your care? It asks these really sacred 
questions, some of them really practical, some of them really lofty. Um, and, and I, these aren't, all moral questions, if that makes sense. And so I think that's partly why it feels so complicated, because it asks questions related to the sacredness of how we commune, how we live together. And I think that's sometimes why people's feelings around it are so strong, you know? Yeah, well, well spoken. Yeah, that, um, the idea of the separation of church and state, you know, is kind of behind some of this question, right? And how, how much can you separate out moral convictions from what we feel like is a hopefully some sort of common consensus in the public space. It's not like we were, uh, you, you don't want to check those uh, convictions and those those things that are good for humanity and good for the flourishing of humanity at the door when you're talking politics, mm -hmm. right? But uh, how do we do so in a way that is not, um, uh, well, as we'll explore some of the challenging uh, ways that we've seen an over uh, conflation of church and state mm -hmm. in the past. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, Sue Alice, why, why is this so complicated? Uh, why, why is there so much heat to this? Any, any, anything you want to explore there? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it, it affects our daily lives mm -hmm. in really obvious ways, everything from, you know, things related to education and what our kids are learning when we take them sure. to school to safety of our country inside and outside of our borders and what that looks like and how that affects us. And certainly the economic implications of what is happening, how our government is responding in trade deals trickles down to even the coffee shop owner in Boone, North Carolina. Right. Um, and so I think it, it feels extra huge when the narrative that we're hearing around us is so extreme on either side. And I think it plays often into core fears that we as humans so often have and things that are really normal of just fearing, like, can I provide for my family the way that I really want to be able to, or need to be able to, to survive. And I think it, it in this season compared more to other seasons that I recall in my 40 something years on this earth. Um, it feels like there's more of this extreme, almost like life or death mentality. Like if you choose this candidate, then nothing will ever work. Or if you choose that candidate, this will never work. And there's just these extreme polarities. And the reality is, yeah, there is major effect in that. But I think as believers, what we have to come back to is um, what N.T. Wright says, he says, the kingdom of God is not from this world, but it is emphatically for mm. this world. Mm. And Psalm 46 keeps coming back. And I think we're very quick to know Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. But that whole chapter starts with God is our shelter and strength. When troubles seem near, God is near and he's ready to help. No fear, no pacing. When the earl, when the earth spins out of control, we are sure and fearless. When mountains crumble and waters run wild, we are sure and fearless. And I think that's exactly what the world is trying to break down in us as believers is that it wants us to be unsure and fearful when as citizens of the kingdom of God, we are to be sure and fearless that no matter what happens, whichever candidate gets elected in whichever election we're talking about, Whatever happens in the world, the earth may be spinning out of control, but we're sure and fearless because that is not where our ultimate citizenship lies. That is not where we find our peace and our satisfaction and our hope. Like our hope cannot come from economic growth in the United States of America. Our hope cannot come from a stellar education system. And I think we have to recognize as believers that there are things that the world is trying to entice us to believe. And I think Ethan, this taps back to a previous table talk mm -hmm. where you kind of talked about empire, but I think there's always been this allure and you see it throughout the whole Bible for us to trust empire, whether that was the children of Israel looking back to Pharaoh and saying, why did you bring us to this desert? Let's just go back. At least we had food or now of us saying, well, you know, we want this stability and economic surety and all of that. That is our temptation, luring us towards empire and stability. And that is not actually what God said our way would be. Jesus never promised that it was going to be easy and smooth. 
And so I think there's this, um, as an American and a Christian, I feel like I have grown up in kind of an environment that there was this um, almost complacency that came because we have had such religious freedom and cultural dominance for a long time. Yeah. And I think often we confuse cultural dominance with actually influencing people for the true good news of Christ, mm -hmm. um, which is not economic stability. It is not, you know, moral superiority. That's not what the kingdom of God is all about. Sometimes those are byproducts mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. and that's great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I think we just always wrestle with how do we, Remember that we're not from this world, but what we have is for this world and mm. it's messy. Yeah, no, that's, that's really, really helpful language. Um, if, if, again, we're, we're trying to understand the relationship between these two citizenships, how do we wear our citizenship representative? Uh, you're referring um, to a table talk we did, uh, I think table talk four. this was also, I believe in a in a uh, an election season in 2022, and uh, we explored kind of some historical frameworks for understanding how I've how has the church historically set with this question, um, and there's been some some creative answers. There's been some concerning answers. <laughs> we looked at uh, uh, kind of this is very very uh, thirty thousand foot level, but we looked at empire, absence, and embassy as three different options for kind of correlating these dueling citizenships. Um, obviously, just a brief summary, empire where you you basically, if, if we were to put citizenship um, of heaven and citizenship of earth into a Venn diagram, so you'll have to join me in that picture, Venn diagram, two bubbles sitting next to each other with an overlap in the middle. And if we kind of shove those bubbles together, um, we would get something like empire where the church and the state are kind of, uh, you know, maybe the church uses the state as a kind of a glove, a glove of empire in order to accomplish, uh, you know, maybe even well-intended things, but there's some deep compromise that happens there. And, and you're alluding to some of that, uh, that, that allure has long loomed over, I think the American story, um, and, and, and is still alive today. We're going to address that uh, here in a bit. And then there's this other um, temptation, perhaps uh, you see uh, people, and I'm, I'm thinking of Constantine, by the way, we'll, we'll, we'll mention him later, but um, yeah, just uh, three, 325 AD or so, you've got uh, an emperor, uh, you know, using um, the whole weight of Rome in order to say, well, we're now a Christian empire, we're now a Christian kingdom. And we'll, we'll problematize that in a moment, but, uh, but I'm sure people are already thinking of some things or ways that that would be a problem. And, and then you've got maybe another... Uh, Kind of poster child, we uh, uh, Simon the Stylite uh, is someone we picked for that table talk to explore, who who uh, decided to escape from the world by climbing up a pillar and sitting there, being non involved. Um, he did write letters to people, so it's a bit of a uh, you know uh, false category. But I think the picture is maybe you can think of um, the Amish or uh, some folks that kind of retreat into a parallel community. And if you imagine our Venn diagram, we're going to pull these things apart. What does uh, is it Tertullian that asked this? Uh, I believe. What does uh, Rome have to do with Jerusalem? In other words, we're gonna we're gonna pull these things asunder and um, and, and live in a parallel way. Now, again, that has uh, you know again some good good intentions to it. Uh, we're in this world, but not of it. Um, but is that is that the program? Or that that introduces its own set of problems. Uh, how can we actually affect human thriving if we say we're not gonna we're not gonna engage the political at all um, for fear of compromise? Is that a compromise in and of itself? Okay, and then there was the embassy model, which is I, I think um, there's there's a lot of defense for that model in terms of uh, you know think of uh, the the exiles going into Babylon and with Jeremiah and you know you're going to work for the shalom of the city that you're in and, and think about that. I mean, that it, wait a minute, you're going into exile because of covenant judgment, but even there you're going to work for the wholeness for the the well being of the people that took over you. R really, like it is this like outpost of a, an alternative way of life that is highly invested and and not invested from a posture of of power. These are disenfranchised people, but they're still expected to affect change in the world around them. And so there's something about that embassy model where we're we're trying to find that overlap, that Venn diagram where it it touches 
um, the, 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 where the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth touch in a way that reflects the cross, that reflects the kingdom. Um, and uh, that, that is something I think we're, we're trying to articulate and put language to these big frameworks. But as we zoom into the very real oh, live debate uh, of, of how to engage in the complexities and the stories and the baggages of the political binary in the U.S., um, it is, uh, it's, it's confusing to know exactly, it, we can have these lofty ideas. I think many of us hold this uh, idea that, yeah, we can represent the kingdom, um, in, 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 you know, these, these arenas, but when, when you, when you look at the, the, the dialogue and the discourse, um, where do we insert ourselves? <laughs> you know, so I don't know if any of you want to address that, but that, yeah. that's, uh, it, 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 this opening question about the complexity, I, I can I can sit here and 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 pontificate and and pull the best and worst parts of church history and say yeah yeah okay we can do this and then I get down to the like the ballot or mm -hmm. the uh you know the the political campaign or okay let me make myself aware of the issues and it all of a sudden gets a little muddy for me I don't know if that's your experience but that that's part of the complexity to me it doesn't seem straightforward yeah I mean I I feel that big time because I think unfortunately we're living in this particular time in a particular place where we are in a two-party system and that tends to kind of force a binary it, it kind of um it 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 means that we might step into a voting booth and say like gosh there's a lot of things uh, a lot of ways in which this candidate represents my values but there are a lot of ways in which they don't mm -hmm. but i only have one other option and that other option gosh there's a lot of ways in which they represent my values mm -hmm. and on a lot of ways in which they don't and so that you end up kind of um then looking issue by issue and say well which one then is more important to right. me right. um i can't it, this is not buffet style voting you know where i take what i want and right. and leave what i don't right. am i throwing my support behind the things that I disagree with. If I cast my ballot for this person, is, am mm. I, and then, that, so then you start saying, well, which, yeah, again, which issue is more important to me, which life is more Im important to me, whose, whose rights are more important to me or whose flourishing is more important to me because it, it, it feels in some ways that we have to choose. Now, I know we're going to talk later about there are lots of ways in which you can invest in the flourishing and the protections of, of people um, within our community beyond just casting a vote. But I think, unfortunately, this two-party system is not only creating these kind of feeling of forced choice. It's a feeling of forced choice, but it's also creating the vitriol. It's creating the, the kind of the teams. We'll vote for this person. You're on their team um, and you're not one of us. And we don't, we no longer seem to assume the best about one another. I mean, there's always been conflict yeah, right. around like, well, how do we live communally together? How do we organize our political lives together? There's always been conflict around this, but it's like, we don't even assume that the other wants the good and we just disagree yeah. on how to get there. It's that the other is evil. The other is, is um, destructive. Um, and you're part of that destruction if I disagree with you. Yeah. And, and the only other thing I wanted to mention kind of about the complexity piece too, is that I, like, I, I, it's just, it's just a reality. Like I, I am a person of faith and I believe that the ways God tells us to live actually leads to the flourishing of humanity. But I also recognize that I live in a country where not everyone shares those beliefs. We, we are, that's what we call a pluralistic society, pluralistic societies where there are lots of different faiths, lots of different uh, convictions represented. And, you know, here we are uh, kind of, uh, I, 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 I guess I, I, what I want to say is that I, I respect the freedom of those people to believe what they believe and to embrace what they embrace and, and to live how they want to live. And we're trying to figure out then how to do that together in a pluralistic society and be at peace with one another. Um, so when, when I'm voting, I recognize I'm not just asking for someone to represent my values. Right. I want them to be able to represent and govern people who are really different than me yeah. and who have different beliefs um, that, and that feels really, really complicated. That's yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, 
one of the things I want our audience to to, to understand also is just that like I, I personally I believe that people can carry their political convictions and have even party affiliations in a way that doesn't demonize the other side. And uh, I think I know personally of people that will vote one way or the other who are aware of the deep inadequacies of their of their own side. Um, and I I just I maybe we we need to demystify that a little bit because. I think we're we're told you're talking about uh, yeah the, the just the sense of vitriol and the, the maybe even the dehumanization. And, yeah, of course, they don't want the good for the country, and I've heard that of, of either side, of course. Um, uh, it, instead of seeing that as a as a way that uh, how do you put it, if we we plant ourselves uh, as as deep partisans uh, without interrogating uh, our kingdom affiliation that might connect us with Christians on the other side of the aisle. Um, I, I think we've foregone a bit of our uh, our opportunity to build common ground for the common good, uh, for as Sue else as you mentioned uh, from from NT right there, uh, not uh, to to help the kingdom for for the earth right. So it, I I don't know if there's a uh, there's something there about that that I uh, the 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 pain if, for for those that are uh, bearing the political season with great pain or confusion or or even just like yeah split convictions if i were to pick issue by issue unfortunately my my ballot you know my, that I'm, isn't red or blue it's a little bit purple right so it's like um i feel uh cheated i guess you could say by the political machine in assuming that one is the best for the country and the other one has nothing to offer. And I think if Christians could be uh, maybe a, an honest and prophetic and even uh, conciliatory voice in that, what well, what would that do to the political discourse? If we, uh, could could it affect some 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 helpful change there? So yeah, uh, Sue, I'll send any, any thoughts on on any of that before we. Uh, yeah, I think further. as you were talking, I just was ruminating on how I think often we kind of put the cart before the horse. And so often we're looking at like checklist of how do I feel about this? How do I feel about that? And so much of what I see in this current political season is people responding to things um, in a very, it's, I feel like you get whiplash sometimes that like just the reactions are so strong and so intense. And I think um, Sharon Hottie Miller said something recently that just really resonated where she said the most powerful subversive Christ-like thing you can do this election cycle is to guard your heart mm. against the mean and arrogant posture that now defines our public discourse, mm. preserve the wellspring of your soul. It will take you so much farther than any worldly outcome. Oh, and I think it, I like, I just have to keep reminding myself of the issues that we're voting for absolutely matter. And putting our voices in at the ballot box, I believe is very important. And I think that it's a way that as a Christian and as an American, I can mm -hmm. use my influence for the flourishing of the community around me. Yeah. What I think has eaten away so much at our country has been the growing sense of individualism and personal rights and this sense of what well, I want what I want but to the point of what Amanda said are we thinking about not only what is best for me but what is best for my community what is best for those people around me to bring about human flourishing um and there was something else that you said that made me think of you know even those who are Christians who are stepping into political leadership roles at whatever level. Yeah. Um, I think we have to remember that no matter where God places us, if it's as a regular voting citizen, if it's in a place of, you know, elected authority within yeah. a country or something like that, that first and foremost, our motivation as believers is not to legislate morality. It's not to impose these things. It, our, our goal, our mission that God has given us is to love one another. And God has sent us in to be his hands and feet to the world and influence through love and grace mm -hmm. and mercy in a way that is countercultural. Do we believe that there are certain things like murder? I think we can all agree that 
saying that is wrong. That is not about human flourishing. We can easily agree about all of those things. But I think that um, just as we're thinking about this uh, a political season of coming back constantly to how do I guard my heart against the temptation to do before I am taking time to be still with God and protect the wellspring of my heart from these extreme reactions that come out that are so divisive. And I yeah. think that what's hard is we don't see a lot of examples of how you can passionately believe in something in a way that does not also then silence other people. Sure. It doesn't mean you might not offend them, sure. but we don't want yeah. to, to silence or denigrate other people when we are passionately voicing what we feel like God has put in our hearts to advocate for. No, that's really Cause, right. Because what was the imperative that Christ gave us is be my witnesses. I need you to be a witness to the risen Christ. I need you to be a witness to the kingdom. And yes, we want to have influence as ambassadors. I I, I take uh, full disclosure. I take the amb ambassador approach <laughs> here, uh, the exiles in Babylon approach. Yes, we are ambassadors. And and sometimes uh, morality takes legislative form. And, and sometimes we want to influence our government to advocate for the needs of the oppressed and the vulnerable and all of those things. But if, if in doing so, we lose our witness, if in doing so, we lose our saltiness, we lose mm -hmm. our light, then mm -hmm. we have failed at our mission. We've utterly failed at our mission. Mm -hmm. We are to be witnesses of the risen Christ, of the resurrected life, of, of what it means to be part of Christ's kingdom. And gosh, I don't want to lose that in the name of political power. No, that's good. And I, I, I do want to clarify, you know, to to have a conviction about what to say that um, we can't legislate morality, for example, is not to say that inside the kingdom community, the voluntary ethic of the kingdom, and it's not to say that there aren't clear ethical mandates in the scripture. It's not a soft read of scripture to say, um, no, I know what I expect of other Jesus followers because the scriptures are clear about X, Y, Z. Maybe they're muddled on a couple of things, but for the most part, the instructions are pretty clear. Uh, and I, and, but to say that the voluntary ethic of I've accepted the Lord Jesus, um, and, and I want to live in a, in a cruciform way is not to say, everyone, um, I'm going to legislate cruciform living uh, for everybody, if that makes sense. So I I, I just want to be clear, um, you know, it, it, I think some people an anticipate that um, uh, that, that, that Christians uh, that, that carry a, a bit of a softer uh, view of governance, uh, therefore do not have um, uh, clarity on moral issues. And I just think, I don't think that's a, a false, a false dichotomy there. Um, it, it, we're trying to exercise responsibility in the kingdom of heaven realm, and then also in the kingdom of earth realm. And, um, you know, if, 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 uh, you know, there's, there's a lot that N.T. Wright, uh, talks about with, um, with Pontius and Jesus and, uh, and, and that, that conversation they have in John about, uh, you know, whose, whose jurisdictions under who, and Jesus submits to the earthly authority there because it's been given by God. So it's this, God is still in charge. God knows what's real and on what, what is moral. And we're still as humans accountable to that. Um, it's just the question we're getting at is how to, what healthful way to be salt and light, to exercise influence, to um, in, in a way that that does pr produce human flourishing, uh, but also uh, does not um, uh, create some sort of false legalism that by obeying the morality of the Bible, you therefore are right with God. Um, uh, we we <laughs> that that project uh, is not is not as focused as you no, know, it's the cross is the invitation.